Ingenuity. Ingenuity. That's right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to give a few minutes for the attendees to all join, and then we'll get started at about three after. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar titled The Human Aspect of Cybersecurity, Cautionary Tale to Mitigate Risk, Social Engineering. Today's webinar is brought to you by Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar, and Coaxis International. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The recording and any supporting resources will also be posted to our website, legalfuel.com. Any questions you may have during today's presentation can be asked through the Q&A feature, which you'll find down at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom control panel. Our presenters will do their best to answer any questions. However, due to time constraints, they may not be able to address them all. Today's presentation has been approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE, including one hour of technology. The course number for today is 4475. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Mr. Christoph Riglott. President and CEO of Coaxis International. Christoph is a nationally recognized expert in the fields of managed data hosting and cybersecurity and is the technical mind that built Coaxis's data center located in Tallahassee, Florida. He is a member of the FBI's counterintelligence task force that includes conducting cybersecurity training alongside the agency and serves as vice, vice president of the Southeast chapter of InfraGuard a collaborative partnership between the FBI and private sector that advances the timely exchange of information necessary to protect the nation's critical infrastructure. Christoph is also active on the board and executive council of the Florida Technology Council. And as president and CEO of Coaxis, Christoph leads the company in providing managed hosting services to legal, financial, healthcare, and criminal justice clients in all 50 states, Canada, and India. I'd now like to hand it off to Christoph and enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Legal Fuel. Uh, today, we're going to talk about cybersecurity. I promise you, we're not going to—I'm not going to bore you with you know firewalls and the usual thing that you um, that you could be expecting. Uh, we're going to talk about the human aspect of cybersecurity. You're going to see it's very interesting. It's a new way, you know, to hack, and I think you're going to find it very nice. We're going to start, you know, this uh, presentation with a real uh, video. Uh, for you to watch and it's going to pretty much set the stage you know what we're going to talk about so let's enjoy the video you're watching bloomberg law i'm lee pacquia like it or not hacking is a fact of life these days but if you're a law firm the very idea of having your data or even worse that of a client stolen is the stuff of nightmares joining me now is mike riley he's a reporter for bloomberg news and he wrote an article this week on just this very subject mike welcome thanks for coming in Sure, thank you. So wanted to uh, get uh, this title of this article out there right away. China-based hackers target law firms to get secret deal data. Scary, scary stuff. What's this all about? Um, so the article is based on, a, on one case in particular. Um, it was a hacking of several law firms in Canada. And, the, and it was around a, a, a deal between uh, a major Australian mining company, BHP Billiton, and a, uh, a potash company in Canada, Potash Corp, which just happens to be the biggest potash company in the world. Potash is a main component in fertilizer. Um, it turns out the Chinese were really interested in, in, uh, in breaking up this deal, and we know that because they hired a couple of major investment banks to help them do this, and that became public. It was written up in both the Financial Times and the New York Times. The same month that the, they hired these two investment banks to break up this deal, uh, the law firms handling the deal uh, for BHP and for Potash Corp were hacked. Um, it turns out that after doing some analysis on the attack, uh, that all fingers point back to China. 
um, both in terms of the malware that was used and uh, and the, the the servers. The what they appear to be after was information on the deal, the sort of insider stuff that they could use uh, to take this down. It turns out that this is not a one-time occurrence. There's a company here in uh, Virginia called Mandiant that specializes in industrial espionage. They estimate that 80 major U.S. law firms were hacked uh, last year. And what they're after often is very confidential stuff, the secrets that their client, that, they're, that they keep for their clients, um, often big corporations. Um, and it's, you're right, this is a, a major challenge for the law profession. After all, confidentiality of, of your client's information is a basic principle on which the whole thing is built. And if law firms are, are seen as the kind of weak link in the chain, a back door that hackers can get at these secrets of their clients, that's a big problem. Now, in researching this article, did you get the impression that law firms are vulnerable for some innate reason, or is the legal profession just an industry that failed to prepare for, uh, for an emerging uh, difficulty in doing business in the modern world? You know, it's a couple of things. They're targets in part because they have a lot of very confidential information. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, a law firm has to know everything about their clients. In fact, in, in, including some of the, you know, the worst secrets because they have to be able to prepare their clients for that. So by their very nature, the information that they have is often very sensitive. It's also true that law firms don't tend to have really great security. I mean, they can. They, they, and in fact, some firms have been uh, contacting security firms to beef up their, their computer security. But as uh, the FBI told me, um, you know, law firms are not used to dealing with this kind of stuff. Partners often want all sorts of privileges that make security harder, make, make it harder for their networks uh, to get nailed down, including they want uh, administrator rights, they want to be able to transfer documents to and from mobile phones, from computers when they're on the road, when they're at some place for the weekend to read them. You know, the documents that are going back and forth in those emails are very, very sensitive documents. Um, and if, you know, if the partner doesn't want to deal with really long passwords or heavy security uh, burdens, that's a problem. This sounds uh, inordinately expensive, taking all the precautions uh, to prevent ag against having uh, hackers uh, access into uh, law firms' data. Uh, any sense that they uh, are, that these precautions are going to meaningfully impact bottom line for law firms? So if law, law firms really wanted to make their uh, their networks bulletproof, it would get very expensive very quickly. Um, we talk, called a lot of law firms, try to get them to talk to us about this. It's a very sensitive subject. Nobody really wanted to mention it. Um, but it is true that uh, having you know state-of-the-art security uh, is a costly proposition. But it's also a question that they have to weigh against the, the, the cost of not doing it. Potential liability they could incur, for example, from losing very uh, confidential information that belongs to clients that may affect litigation, it's potentially huge. Any sense that these firms have a handle on the uh, potential liability uh, stemming from these issues? Are, are you finding that they're thinking about this for the very first time, uh, say, this month, or is this something that they've seen coming? You know, I think they're beginning to think about it more and more. I mean, some firms are much more savvy about this than others. Uh, big international firms um, that deal with uh, intellectual property rights, all sorts of things, I think, are having to think about this. The question is how quickly they're moving uh, and what they're doing about it. And I don't get the sense that they're moving particularly quickly. Neither did the FBI. They held a meeting last uh, November with the top 200 firms in New York City, basically to tell them, look, you guys are a target. You need to start thinking about your security. Um, this, and they were doing that because they just didn't think the law firms were thinking about it. Oh, this is tough stuff, and it's certainly hitting the legal profession at a time where they have a lot of uh, other concerns to be worried about. Mike, I want to thank you so much for your time today. This was uh, really interesting. You're very welcome. That's Mike Riley. He's a reporter here at Bloomberg News. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also Bloomberg.com. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching. So there, there you have it. It's a pretty interesting video. Uh, and you have to remember, um, I'll do multiple reminders during the, the session here, but, you know, uh, attorney and law firms, you know, they, they're, they build their business on, you know, client privilege, you know, confidentiality. So it is going to be very important what we talk about. Here's what they said, though, uh, cybersecurity, you know, and hacking. So here's this uh, person here, Kevin Midnix is a world hacker, very, very known, and is not working for the FBI because he got caught. Uh, but here's what he says, companies spend millions of dollars on firewall, encryption, and secure access device. 
is money wasted. None of these measures address the weakest link, the security chain, in the security chain. So what does that mean? Does that mean I shouldn't have a firewall? No, it doesn't mean that. What Minix means is that you can have the encryption, you can have the firewall, you can have the dual you know, uh, authentication. If you don't, this is not enough. It is a good step towards security, but it's just not enough. And today we're gonna see why is this not enough. So hackers, we used to hack, you know, firewalls because they weren't very well built and, you know, they had a lot of flaws and holes in it. Uh, but, you know, as we go along in 2021 right now, firewall, I have to tell you, uh, they are very good. They're very good. And, you know, to hack, you know, a firewall is getting more and more, um, you know, difficult to do that. So a hacker do not think like, you know, people think, you know, in general, they're going to always go for the easiest path. Okay. So the easiest path is going to be the human hacking. So now you're going to tell me, well, I understand how you hack a firewall or a computer, but how is it that you hack a human? Okay. What do you use to hack a human? That's what we're going to talk about. You hack a human using what we call social engineering. And what does that mean? It is the use of deception to manipulate individual into divulging confidential or personal information that can be used for fraudulent purposes. That might be a gray area for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now a story that is a true story and uh, tell you a little bit how that works. Okay. So uh, some years ago, I was hired uh, to hack a bank, okay, a financial institution. And it could be just like a law firm or whatever, but it was a bank. And they told me, you know, we want to run a test, you know, to make sure we're secure. And then we want you to, to uh, try to hack us and get any type of data. I said, okay, that was perfect. We signed the agreement and allowing me, you know, to hack them, you know, and um, I started my job. So let's go back to what Minix says about the firewall. Just keep that in mind a little bit, okay? So what I did is I set up, you know, my computer at the office, okay? And I did start hacking the firewalls. Knowing what? Knowing I was not going to be successful, I knew that because I knew they had a nice firewall and I saw it, you know, and it, it was nice, you know, so it's, it's, it's not something I was going to be successful on. But what I did is I launched an attack on the firewall, okay? After the execution of the contract, I did my homework as any social hacker would do. Social hacker will not, you know, uh, do their job in one day. They're going to look at your company, they're going to see who comes in, who comes out, what time, who is it, they're going to analyze, you know, what they do, what you guys do, okay? You're not, you're not going to know about it, but they will. So for that bank, I did the same thing, and I pretty much selected a branch that I was very small, and I know the bank did not pay too much attention to it because it didn't drive a lot of business. So now just imagine, you know, I set up, you know, my computer, and I just start attacking, you know, the firewall. Their firewalls go, of course, you know, red and it just showed me, you know, attacking it and trying to penetrate, you know, the firewall and the environment. And of course, you know, the firewall does its job. It's stopping me and stopping me. But I'm leaving my computer at the office doing what it does. OK, and just keep, you know, the chief security officer at the bank preoccupied, looking at the firewall and saying, oh, he's coming in. I see him and we're blocking him. And that's perfect. At the meantime, what I do as a social hacker, and that's why I want to bring your attention right now, is I uh, disguise myself. I put a badge, which I will show you here. I put a badge, and basically those badge, you can make a fake badge within five minutes, okay? So I put a badge, and at the time I was a, uh, a um, the internet, you know, uh, provider, you know, uh, worker. So I said, and so I come up, you know, to the branch, which I know was very small and it was in broad daylight. So forget the alarm system, forget everything, broad daylight and got it to the bank and, you know, introduce myself, you know, with my badge. OK, that, as you can see, is real. This is my name. This is my pictures. It's a real badge for us. So all they know I do work for Centel or, well, maybe the Orlando Power. OK, so I get into the, the bank and I tell them, I say, well, you know, I was sent, you know, by your CSO and, uh, you know, I just, I know you have some internet problem. At the time, of course, everybody, everybody says, you know, the internet is a little slow. So nobody's ever happy about the internet speed anyway. So I said, oh yeah, yeah. She said, you know, um, she said, yeah, we've noticed that a little slow down. And I said, well, ma'am, 
I said, you know, this is my badge, you know, some, some century, uh, center. And I said, uh, if you allow me, you know, I just need access, you know, with your computer and I think I can figure it out and uh, I'll write a report, you know, to your CSO and name him. He's like, okay, no problem, no problem. So very cordial, boss of us. And she sit me down and I was very, very nice with her. And she said, well, would you like some water or a cup of coffee? I said, yeah, water will be perfect. Thank you. So now I'm on the computer alone while she's getting me you know, some water and I'm starting to do my job. I get a little USB flash drive, plug it in the computer and start you know, collecting a little bit of data. My intention was not to collect a huge amount of data. It was just a simple to show them that I had access to their environment, okay? So I do my job, she brings me the water, I open, you know, the common prompt, which is a black windows and you can start, you know, starting to do some ping and things like that. Short, I did my work and she comes back and I say, well, I find it. I know exactly where it's coming from. I see, you know, where it's slow here. And so that's perfect. She's like, oh, great, great, great. I said, yeah. So I said, listen, give me about 72 hours and I'm gonna write my report. And then you should see another technician and we'll, we'll, we'll fix you up, okay? And she's like, well, thank you very much. We appreciate you your help and you coming here and that's perfect. So off I go with my bottle of water, my flash drive and off the bank. At that time, remember, uh, no alarm system, no nothing. I didn't touch the firewall. I didn't touch you know, the encryption. I didn't touch anything. I bypassed all this, all of it, using a technique that we call social engineering. So I get back to my office, look at my computer. Of course, what is the computer doing? It's attacking, you know, the firewall, you know, at the bank and they're all excited over there and, you know, I can get in and that's perfect. Well, great. The next day I, uh, I'm being called, two days after I'm being called, you know, for a meeting to present, you know, my report. And so I have, you know, as you know, in the bank, you know, the president, vice president, you know, chief security officer, all of those people, you know, are on the table. And trust me, they have a big smile because their CSO told them that I was not successful. So very relaxed on the chair. And they said, well, you know, uh, we we'll know what you tell us, but, um, you know, we were pretty happy about it. I'm like, okay, great, great, great. And they said, so were you successful? And I'm like, um, well, I said, um, and when I start saying well, they started to be like, uh huh, I did not expect a well, I didn't expect to know, but okay. I said, well, I said, I was not successful hacking your firewall. And they're like, oh, great, 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 great. I said, but I was successful in getting data. And so now all the smiles around the table went with no smile. There was no smile anymore because they flat out didn't understand what I was talking about. Because for them, if I was not capable of going through the firewall and their encryption system, then I was not capable of getting any set of data. So I started telling them, I said, you know, so firewall was okay. So that's a good point for you. But I said, I was able to get some data and they were very dubious and says, uh, we don't think so, but how, how would you prove that? And so I took my flash drive and handed it out to the CSO and says, go in your laptop and tell me if you recognize, you know, some of your uh, data here. And so he did and he plugged it in and he looked at it and says, oh boy, this is our data here. I'm like, it is. And so now they're not smiling at all. They're like, okay, um, how did you get this? How did you get this? And I said, well, I just walked in bought the light in one of your branch and I just has to sit down on the front of a computer and get some data. And now they get very nervous. They're like, okay, this is, this is you, you're kidding. I'm like, no, how do you think I got this data? And so I give them the name of the person. I said, when I give you this name, I said, I don't want you to you know, fire her or nothing because she's not at fault. She's just not being trained. So there is no way for her to know, you know this kind of hacking you know, mechanism. And she's like, okay, that's fine. And so they call her uh, in my presence and says, uh, did you see a technician coming you know, a couple of days ago and ask you to do this? And she's like, yeah, yeah, very nice guy. And I did this and he said he was gonna give a report you know, because our internet is slow. And so now they're like, unbelievable. And I said, well, that's what it is. Uh, you know, so they, they got hacked, but not in the conventional way. And I hope you get that. This is what we're gonna talk about today. And that's what makes this session very interesting because this is not your common way, you know, to be hacked. So what did I use, you know, to, to do my job here? I use a method and in social engineering, 
we have a lot of method, you know, to do that. And we're going to see in the next slide, you know, on the video, you'll see it's a very interesting video, many, many methods, you know, to, uh, to social hack someone. So the one I used, you know, for the bank was called pretexting. And what is it? Is the practice of presenting oneself as someone else in order to obtain, you know, private information. Okay. I'm sure you've seen some movie like The Saint and stuff like that. And, you know, and, and all those, you know, um, you know, kind of movie, you know, they do things like that, you know, they do use pretexting, you know, it is very easy. It's a simple way, you know, to do it. I can pretext myself to be a UPS driver. I can pretext myself to be anything. And I want you to think about that. I know some people say, well, but if you do that, we can always go and check. Well, when you have a company like CenturyLink or UPS or whatever, and you come with a badge and an ID that match your badge, how long would you think it would take you to get to the HR department and verify my identity and if I really work here? Days. And if I'm here to help you, well, you're certainly not going to jeopardize you know, my help you know, uh, just to verify a badge. I'm going to show you my ID. I'm showing you my badge. It should be good enough, right? So, And it should be at the most time. So I'm going to show you a video okay uh, on the next slide it's a very interesting video it's going to explain you different method of social engineering and then we're going to go in detail after that so please enjoy the video and then uh, we're going to talk right after this hackers are everywhere from ashley madison to jp morgan from jennifer lawrence to the federal government our biggest celebrities corporations and institutions have all been the targets of devastating cyber attacks I wanted to see how bad a hack can get. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas at DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year, and see what they found. This might not have been the best idea. DEF CON is the biggest hacker convention of the year. It's place where thousands of hackers come to hear talks to demonstrate their newest hacks. It's actually a place that's so dangerous to, to be on the internet that they tell you to turn off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth on your phone. And they tell you not to use the ATMs too because those could be hacked as well. This is the DEF CON ballroom. It's sort of the main room where things are happening. And it's pretty wild. I think this is Car Hacking Village. This car is locked. Can you get me in? I'll unlock it for you. This should be good. <laughs> Hacking is no longer like this fringe activity. And if you are at DEF CON, there's a good chance that you're here because you want to learn what could happen to you or your company. Anyone here first time in the SCCTF? Holy crap. I invited Chris to hack me uh, with his team. Um, but they're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. We help people with human security issues by testing vulnerabilities for, um, for like a network test, but it's for the people network. We test those vulnerabilities, see where the holes are, and then help people learn so they can patch them. Can we try some of this? Can we try some, yeah, see I mean, if it works? Yeah, we, we probably could uh, have our star visher here make some phone calls. As <laughs> Let's girlfriend. do it. Sure. Do you want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically, um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? 
So I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Okay, my Jessica name. Jessica uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry. So there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She no even gets the support person to change my Thank password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just no, basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. I really thought that my cell phone company would protect me. I mean, like, this is the most basic stuff, and and they're not doing it. And if they're not doing it, you know, all these other businesses aren't doing it either. with a phone and an internet connection can do social engineering. But I was curious, what can a hacker with serious coding skills do? Well, DEF CON is the world's biggest hacking convention. It's hacking everything, hacking uh, social, hacking hardware, hacking software, hacking various systems. I asked Dan Tentler, a well-known security researcher, to turn all of his firepower on me. I did get into quite a number of things that I found so what were the first things you did? How did you start hacking me? Uh, I quickly found your Squarespace blog and had an idea. Uh, basically, what I did was created a bogus Squarespace site and sent an email to you, um, a fish asking you to go to this website, run this certificate installer. And I did it, because yeah. I'm an idiot. So once you ran that, uh, it gave me access to your computer, and I created several fake pop-ups that looked like system pop-ups uh, that would ask you for your credentials. You didn't even have to have my passwords. No, you gave them to me. I gave them to you. Yeah. So I, I stole your 1Password keychain. That's and 1Password is where I store all my other passwords. So effectively by... And your social security number and your Amex stuff and all your stock trading and bank information. I can send email to everyone in this room as you. I am you right now if I wanted to be. If my evilness is working correctly, it should actually be taking pictures of your desktop and pictures through your webcam every two minutes. And I have been watching you for about two days now. In oh coffee shops, at your mom's house, on a plane. Here's your editing stuff, there's you like Oh my god, so this is literally... Every two minutes. Through my webcam. Yeah, through this guy. How badly could you have messed up my life? I could have made you homeless. I could have made you homeless and penniless. How? Like, how, how would you make me homeless? Like, I have control of your, your digital life in its entirety. I have all your credentials, I have all your access to all your financial information, all your work information, all your personal information. I can pay people with your bank account or your Amex account. I am you. I can fully impersonate. Like, the only thing I couldn't doctor would be like your fingerprints. This is like as bad as it gets. It's ridiculous, yeah, it's bad. So it turns out that Dan Tentler is very good at his job. I mean, he hacked the hell out of me. He got everything. Well, I mean, frankly, I want to take my computer and throw it into the deepest part of the ocean, and I want to become a hermit, and I want to never touch a piece of technology again, because holy shit, that was, that was everything. That was the keys to my entire life, and he just, he just pulled them out of his pocket. If I keep my passwords and my bank accounts safe, I could still be in danger from hacks. Because with factories, power plants, and other major infrastructure being controlled by network computers, the world itself is hackable. I'm going to meet Marina Cordefil. She's studying hacking chemical plants. She's thinking about what happens if hackers decide to go after infrastructure. But this is the kind of hacking that could really ruin like an entire country. Who should be most worried about chemical plant hacking? Well, pretty much every every plant, because big business beats big money. So the hackers are always there where the money are. So it's a good target. So for example, the most uh, common cause is extortion. A large number of extortion attacks has happened already. And our critical infrastructure is vulnerable. So a, a, let's just say like a nuclear power plant could have a big accident and they think our machines just malfunctioned, our safeguards didn't work, but it's actually someone hacking. Yes, but the worst case scenario, if it will be incompetent or unskillful attacker who does not understand what he's breaking in and that they will do something what, uh, with a large or extensive collateral damage. 
but probably most scariest is hacking the satellites because now everything navigates with the GPS. So basically, even uh, the huge oil tankers in the sea, they're completely navigated automatically by the um, signals from the satellites. So by si simply disrupting the satellite signals, you can lose the entire tanker and uh, or the aircraft can collide. And, and, and it, to me, it seems obvious, like, this is how war will be conducted in the future. But it's much easier than sending a million ground troops in or, you know, it's, or buying, you know, drones to fly over uh, an enemy state. Like, this is, we're, we're sort of looking at the future of not just infrastructure, but like global conflict. There's almost too much for me to worry about here. I'm almost just sort of numbed. People keep telling me, oh, this could get hacked, and that could get hacked, and this other thing could get hacked, and oh, the chemical plants could get really hacked. And at some point, like, I've got to get out of bed in the morning. So I have to find a way to make myself feel a little bit better about all of this. So I'm meeting Morgan Marquibois, a cybersecurity consultant and the director of security at First Look Media, for some advice on locking down my digital life. Should I be feeling helpless, or, or can I help myself here? Do you worry about trained martial artists beating you up on the street? Not particularly. But you're aware that they exist. You're also aware that you probably couldn't do anything about it if one of them wanted to beat you up in the street. Probably not. Right? And I mean, you can actually possibly think about the danger that hacking poses to you right now in much the same terms. But the first step is actually thinking sanely about digital security, which most people don't do. So for instance, you know, how do we protect our physical integrity? Maybe we don't walk down the dodgy alley at night, right? People who haven't spent any time thinking about digital security don't actually know what the dodgy alleys of the internet are. Like, should I click that link? You know, maybe I shouldn't install the software. And I thought I was pretty good. Like, I thought it's, I was... It's tough. But chances that a skilled black hat is deciding for no reason whatsoever to attack you, I mean, it's, it's actually reasonably small. Like, it sort of begs the question why, right? You could hire security people to, uh, you know, look after your online life, but you probably don't need to do that. We used to think of hackers as being sort of fringe characters, but now when so much of our lives are lived on these connected devices, they're power brokers. They can make or break us. I'm trying to log into our account. They stole your 1Password keychain. I mean, they know more about this stuff than anyone, and that's a power that is going to become increasingly valuable. We need to know where our flaws are so that we can be safer. And I think the best thing to do is to enable them to help us rather than shoo them away. Do you guys have any of those little things that you put over the, the camera on your laptop? Paradoxically, I feel more secure now than I did last week, because now at least I know what I have to fix. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it didn't scare you too much, but you know, uh, several things I want to reiterate about this video. Uh, the presenter feels better now because he knows, and that's my intention today, is to train you a little bit so at least you know, okay? Uh, also is to talk about, you know, social engineering. You see that, that lady, you know, act, you know, with the baby. It takes nothing. There is no firewall. There is nothing involved in that. And I want to address myself to attorneys and also paralegal because I know paralegal are extremely busy. And just so you know, you know, an attacker like this, social engineer, always going to attack, you know, the weakest link, like I told you, you know, before. So when I know that, you know, paralegal are very busy and things like that, those are going to be my target because I know you focus on your job because I know, you know, you're doing this and you're very busy and you have an attorney going to court and you have to produce documents, paper and everything. And I know you, maybe you don't have time, you know, to see, you know, everything. Uh, so you will be my weakest link here. More of this story, uh, and we're going to go in depth a little bit after that, is, you know, establish security protocol, of course, uh, train employees. Um, employees are not being trained, are becoming the weakest link, and this is becoming target, basically. Uh, that's why I told the guys, you know, at the bank, I said, you, the CSO, are very well trained. That's perfect. It's fantastic. You may not fall for it, but... Anybody else, you know, at your bank, are they have the same training? Are they being trained? And if they're not, this is what I'm going after. I'm not going after you. Test your cybersecurity network. Uh, people think uh, a lot, you know, that testing, you know, is a punishment or something like that. It is not because a test, you know, will tell you where you're good at, where you're not so good at. And when you know this, then you can fix it. 
Okay. So let's talk about spear fishing. And I want to, you know, spend a little time on this because this is the easiest way to get into a company by bypassing security system, firewall, dual encryption, dual authentication, everything. Okay. And you know that, you know, we deal with email all the time. So what is spear phishing? It's a foreign practice of sending email, okay? And we know everybody is using email, especially in law firm, okay? From a known or trusted sender in order to induce targeted uh, individual to reveal confidential information. If you remember, uh, I see the third person who hacked, you know, the presenter, you know, with uh, seeing his picture and everything. That's how he did it. Okay, creating an account, send an email, he opened the email, and then, you know, he got into his computer and his life was over after that. So let's see some example. I talk a lot with, you know, uh, financial institution, and uh, we are in tax season right now, so this is a good example, actually. Uh, email from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, when those email, when those phishing email you receive, they're not just dumb email. They are very well formatted. They're formatted for a certain reason. And like for this one uh, is to gain trust out of you, okay? A social hacker is always gonna try to gain the trust. That's what I did with the bank. That's what the lady did when they called, you know, trying to gain the trust. Um, the internal revenue service, you like them, you don't like them, whatever it is, but you know, they're not people who are going to come and hack you, right? Uh, and when they send you something, you pretty much have to look into it, okay? So this one, uh, as you can see, you know, your client will notice some of your uh, income information appears to be missing or incorrect. Guess what? This email is not going to go in July or August. It's always going to go during tax season, during when people are busy filing the tax return or something like that, and they will pay attention to it, okay? Now, because you're the paralegal, and I'm going to send that to some targeted people, so CPAs during tax season, paralegal when they're very busy and things like that, I'm going to make your life easy. So if you look at this email, Blue Ribbon Internal Revenue Service. So I'm capturing your eyes with the IRS. So now I'm building your trust. I said, okay, they're not here to hack me. There is a problem, but they're not here to hack me. So now I've gained a little bit of your trust. Then you read it. And because you're not busy and I'm a very nice guy, I'm giving you a link, right? And because I'm giving you a link, that link is the danger. Once you click on that link, you're pretty much mine. After that, we're launching, you know, tools, you know, on your computer that the antivirus will not detect. And I can see just like the guy saw him on the camera every two minutes, I can see anything that you type or anything that you see, okay? How do you detect those? Well, they're pretty easy, but again, they're gonna be sent when you don't have time to read. And we have to go into detail here. Look at the third line, IRS to recipient, reply to, do not reply, that's normal at irs that's okay dot update that's okay dot com the dot com is not okay the irs will never send you first of all a type of email and second of all from a dot com address but because you're busy and because i've got your attention and you trust me you might oversee that you might not look at this okay let's see another one those are big ones uh our cso here uh it can we can not hack, but we can replicate a bank website within you know four or five minutes. So the website is going to look exactly like the bank website. It's going to feel like the bank website is going to be exactly exactly the same. So same thing here. What do we see in those email? The trust, okay, building trust building. So I'm coming from Bank of America, okay. Now some of you are going to tell me, well, I don't bank of Bank of America. That's fine. I'm a hacker. I don't think like you. I'm going to mass sell. I'm going to mass send it. And one of you is going to bank up Bank of America. I know that much. Out of 100,000 that I send, one of you or two of you is going to bank up Bank of America and I get my target. I don't need too many targets. I need one or two. So this one is being, you know, coming from Bank of America. I'm capturing your eyes to the Bank of America logo and everything. And I tell you what's happening. Okay. So I'm guiding your eyes, not to the top, but that's where the problem is, to the center of the email. We recently reviewed your account and uh, suspect that your Bank of America account may have been accessed or by an authorized third party. Uh -huh. Curiosity killed the cat, right? So basically, just to be sure, just to be reassured, you are going to click on it, 
okay? Which, because I'm a nice guy again, right? So I don't want you to go and open your browser and type those, it's too long, right? And I know you're busy, right? So here is a link, just click on, you know, bankofamerica.com, you know, slash unlock, and then it's okay, right? I want to get you to here. Well, once you click on that link, okay, I can see anything that you type. So I can see user ID and I can see your password. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it once, okay? And then I'm going to do it twice to make sure that, you know, what you type is the right password. So basically, I'm going to deny you on the first time you try. And you're going to be like, no, no, that's my password. Or maybe, maybe I, I misspelled it, right? Maybe I did a typo. So you're going to retype it the second time very carefully, okay? And so now on my screen, every time you type, I can see what you're typing. And now I got your user ID and your password, right? Twice, so it's confirmed. And then at that time, I'm actually going to prompt you to the Real Bank of America website. And, you know, it's going to open. You're going to be like, oh, okay, well, so that's my, okay, password, login. Everything looks fine. I've got my money. I got access to everything. Okay, okay. Well, I guess, you know, the, the unlock things, you know, work. So that's great. You know, it's, it's fantastic, okay? Well, yeah, it's fantastic. You have access to your bank account. But guess what? So am I. I do have access to your bank account also. And... Because social hackers are not the hacker that you used to know, you know, 15 years, 20 years ago. You know, those guys, you know, they came and they broke everything. You know, they, they broke your server and they delete all your data and stuff like that. Some of them, they still are here, you know, and they're not that smart, but, you know, they just want to cause, you know, problems. The smart one who actually here to make money, that's the one, you know, you have to be very afraid of. So once I know your credential, now I can go to your bank account, you know, and log in, with your login and the password anytime I want. And you don't know that. You have no idea that I'm doing it, okay? So basically what I'm gonna do, because I'm very smart, is I'm gonna look at you for a couple of months. I'm gonna see, you know, when you deposit your paycheck, what type of spending you're doing, anything, wires and everything. And I'm gonna wait and wait until the right time. And at that time, I'm gonna transfer your money out, you know, to one of my bank accounts overseas or whatever, and you'll never see it again. And here is the problem. When that's gonna happen, of course, you're gonna go see your bank and be like, what happened? Someone, you know, I mean, I did not do that. And what is the bank gonna tell you? Well, you logged in with your name and password. So yeah, you did do that. And so now you're gonna to have to prove that you actually did not do that. Good news is that, you know, you probably are an attorney today or working for an attorney. So you're probably gonna to have to use your own service or do something like that because it is going to be very painful, you know, to do this. It's going to be very painful to prove that, you know, you did not do that because I've got your identity just like the other guy, okay? So protect yourself, protect your business, okay? Be prepared. Be prepared. That's what we're doing today a little bit. This is not, you know, we have much more to talk about, but that's what we're doing a little bit, okay? Initiate and validate. This is what we, you know, came up with the FBI. It's our best call of action. If you do not initiate a conversation, then don't reply to it from any email from banks or anything like that. If you have not initiated something, ignore it, okay? And then validate before you do anything. So for the bank website and for the IRS website, if you see, every time it's a problem with the link, that 10 seconds for you to review that link and make sure it's the right one is gonna save you a ton of money and a ton of wasted time that you have to consult with an attorney to get you out of, you know, this problem, okay? Again, train your employee and again, test your system, okay? Train your employee and then hire, you know, people, you know, like us and, you know, train you, I mean, and test it, make sure that it works, make sure your training is actually fruitful and that it actually works. Let's see, uh, so this is some, just to show you, uh, little bit of, you know, report that we can, uh, that we can do here, you know, uh, those are phishing email that, you know, are being sent out, you know, to uh, every month. Uh, the people never know when, uh, the recipient never know whose recipient is going to be. And basically it's, it's fake phishing email. So as you see on the right side here, it says, you know, uh, open and clicked. Okay. So that means that out of this, this is just a simple, you know, fake company, but this one, you would have like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, six, seven or whatever open, and then one, two, three, four clicked. This is way too much. And some people will be like, oh, look, you know, out of, you know, 50, only, you know, two clicked on it. 
guess how many I need, you know, to get into your company? I need one. I don't need two, I don't need three. If I have two or three, better off with me, but I only need one to do this. So basically the right side here should be at zero and the open side should be at zero. And so training people on a monthly and regular basis is what keeps you sharp, basically. Um, here's another one. Uh, dear captain, as you can see, uh, your mail server is holding you know, for incoming message because of, you know, blah, blah, blah. And now, uh, again, I'm, I'm giving you a review and verify your account. So always, I'm always a nice guy. I'm going to put, you know, something here to facilitate your life. Okay. It's a link. It's a, something like that. It's a block, you know, review and verify your account. And once you click on it, you are pretty much done. This is it. And, and, the, and the bad thing about it is that you don't know that I'm in. It's not invasive. So you would not know that. Okay. Here's another one uh, that everybody knows. Everybody knows this one, okay? So this one is Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox uh, is being used many, many times by law firm and things like that. So um, look at the top left, if you would, with me a little bit. Uh, you would have, you know, Dropbox. That's fine. And it's no dot reply. So that's good. At dropbx.com. So in this entire email, which looks fine, okay, the only problem with this email is one letter missing. So just imagine when you are paralegal, when you have an attorney, when you guys are busy during the day, I mean, I'm counting that you're not going to see this and I have a great chance of succeeding because it's just one letter, okay? I saw work, you know, someone has invited you uh, and maybe you to view the folder upcoming review on Dropbox. So, you know, you, you work with people, so they send you documents. So yeah, I'm gonna click on it. And again, that's when you made the mistake. You click on it, you may see something, you might not see anything, so whatever. But when you do this, I'm in. Okay, we have different payload to do every, anything that we wanna do. You can have payload that read that everything that you type. We have payload that takes, you know, pictures of your computer. We have payload that uh, start, you know, copying data and sending data, you know, to my address, you know, to my one of my phone on the internet. We have payload depending on what I want to do with your company that will that will do it basically. Basically, okay. Um, this is a things that you know you're probably using this one more like on a personal level than more. Okay, so Venmo for those of you who don't know, I'm pretty sure you do, but it's it's a uh, your website, you know, that makes you, you know, pay, you know, um, maybe like tutors, you know, or uh, drivers, things like that, you know, you can pay them, you know, on Venmo. Uh, again, if you look at the top left, one little mistake, you know, again, it's just one name. And again, here, someone is paying you, transfer, you know, a date and amount, you get paid $20, view, and when you view, when you click on view or, you know, the other one, this is it. And I want to, you guys to pay attention on the little, little detail here. And I want you to balance those little details that makes this email a phishing email and not a good email with the amount of work that you guys are producing every day. And I know that you guys are busy and I know this, those things, you know, works. And every time we have problems, you know, with people that we see, it's like, well, I clicked on it and, you know, and I really didn't know, or I didn't pay attention. And is that your fault? Not really. It's because, you know, we're good hackers. So we know exactly when we're going to be able to hit you and we know exactly what's going to trigger, you know, for you to click, you know, on the email. Because, you know, you know, you see your mailbox every day is full of things and stuff like that. So if you don't know it, you know, going to delete. But if you know it, if you want to see or if you're curious, then you're actually going to click on it. Okay. Remember one thing, okay. It's now we've determined that, you know, it doesn't have a lot to do with a firewall, although you need to have a firewall. And dual encryption, dual authentication, all that can be bypassed, okay? Remember also the financial, you know, problem with it. Um, you, uh, you are law firms, okay? When you have clients that come in, and it doesn't matter, you know, what type of law firm you are, okay? But the attorney tells the client, says, our conversation is confidential, and I promise you that it will stay confidential. Well, now the problem with that statement is that the conversation is going to be brought into a computer at some point of time. And if that computer is or that environment is, you know, vulnerable, 
then the promise you know, with the client is being broken. And then when that happens, there's going to be financial consequences, but also think about it, it's going to be a trust consequence you know, for, your, for your firm because those clients are going to say, well, I can't talk to you anymore because I can trust you. And then you know, I tell you something that I think is confidential and you put it on your network and now you know it's everywhere you know in the world. So those are the two aspects you know you have to be really really concerned about. Okay, this is not you know the past. This is the present. This is what's happening right now. And trust me, it is going to be um, more and more as we go. We've seen about a 682 percent um, increase during COVID-19, of course, because everybody went remote, and remote is great. But if you don't know how to do remote or if it's not managed correctly. Think about it one second. If you go home and you can remote into your company and do some work, if you do have this type of access, so do I. And I will find it. So if it's not done very, very well, now because you have to work remotely, you're opening your company to the rest of the world. I hope I did not scare you too much today. And uh, we are going now into, uh, if you want some Q&A, so we don't have... We have a little bit of time in our left, so please don't hesitate you know, to uh, send us some Q&A. Any question that you have, any concern that you have, uh, I'm here and I'm waiting uh, for you to, uh, to send that. Thank you very much for your patience and thank you very much for listening. Jonathan? Thank you, Christoph. That was a great presentation. Um, definitely scared. We'll definitely pay more attention to the emails <laughs> that come into my inbox. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions in the Q&A. Right. Um, I will remind everybody that you know, this was approved for, by the Florida Bar for one hour of general DOE credit, including one hour of technology. And that course number, again, is 4475. And again, that's 4475. And if there's no other questions, I guess we'll let Christoph off the hook and everybody get back to their days. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all have a good day. You too.